because w the self under siege, part of what it's about is the complexity of meaning. Now, this makes the world a double world in a way. The world is on the one hand as rationalized as it's ever been. That means that down to its smallest detail we have chased uh, what you might call, what I will call information, what universities call knowledge. I don't view it as knowledge, I'm sorry, I just, I look at it as information. I, 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 it, it is a, that itself is a deflationary term. We, we have tons of that. It's rational, that we chase it down. Now here's the paradox, is that a world filled with instrumental, what I will call instrumental rationality, and by instrumental I will mean technical rationality, the kind that is measurable, quantifiable, that can be found in many of the sciences, in banking, accounting, and so on, advertising, the law, and so on, that this kind of technical reason produces a situation in which human beings themselves don't feel rational. And, it, and, and with the, especially with a younger audience, and I think this is really true, with uh, uh, the 20 or 30-somethings that are out there listening to me, ask around and see how many of your friends, if you think the self isn't under siege in the late 20th century, ask yourself how many of your friends are on 12-step programs to stop something. Ask yourselves, given the current use of the word dysfunctional, who's not? I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, I, all, I mean, this is, to me, the best sign that the self is under crisis. There's a 12-step program to stop eating. Of course, if it succeeded utterly, you would die. 12-step programs to stop having sex. If that succeeded utterly, the species would die. 12-step programs to stop thinking are what we need next. Of course, they have those already. They're called network television. That's sort of a 12-step program that's on every night. Uh, but in any case, the self is under siege in this sense. Now, I don't want to, here's going to be the problem of the lecture, is to try to give a sense for what the self was sort of more authentically. Because that's the really difficult nut to crack, is that I too am, am sort of left with what one uh, person who enjoys some of the paradoxes of chaos is called a fractal self you know, a fractal self, one that sort of reproduces itself and I'm like this over here and this over here, I'm a poker player here and a lecturer here and a, and a TV star here, yeah, and so on. But, uh, I mean, it's not like that, you're, that this is some wisdom I can impart simply to you, but a joint project and I hope will lead to a conversation about it. Okay, uh, <clears throat> just a few more things here I need to get in. And they're very important. We are in a unique situation vis-a-vis -vis meaning, the meaning of the self in our own human autonomy. It is a unique situation. For, ye, for, 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 for as far as I know, most of the history of this species, there have been culturally available reservoirs of meaning that were relatively stable and within which we could find a place for ourselves. Now, this is not an argument to go back to any of those archaic structures. I'm just trying to, to bring alive how they gave meaning. I mean, a slave's life had a meaning. It was a horrible and barbaric meaning from my perspective, but it was a meaning. And so that doesn't, this is not an argument for slavery. I think those are only made today by people like Pat Buchanan. I don't have rational arguments to return to the institution of slavery. I'm sure somebody on the far right will think of one for me, but I don't have them. But we have, we have, we have eras dominated by what are, are fairly called worldviews, where people find themselves within those views. They find a place that their life can have meaning within it. In particular, and for, our, and for, our, for Western uh, culture, the great religions have been such a place within which people could find the sort of 
what you might call life's final questions. Why am I here? What good do I do? What's the point in me being here? Where do I go when I'm through? Big question. Job kind of had problems with that one. God didn't really answer him. He just got pissed off. I mean, you know, if you've read the book of Job, you know God doesn't answer the question. He just gets mad. Who the hell are you, Job? You tiny little mutant. What is this? You know, I made you. I can make another one just like you. Shut up. I mean, you know, this is... God, I mean, I'm not saying God was wrong to answer that way. I, I, I'm not in a position to talk about God that way. Uh, no, in, 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 as long as that could sustain people, faith in some kind of higher being, then there could still be a reservoir of meaning. And if you notice, that's still the neoconservative response is that we need a religious revival in this country. The trouble is with that response is that we have to pass through, one, a set of complex intellectual maneuvers where we either know or suspect we know. And I'll say, I, this will be sort of really to get around to the topic of the first lecture, whether we know or we suspect we know that those belief systems have come under considerable suspicion, okay? Considerable suspicion. In fact, one of the legacies of the, of the 19th century and this is the title of my first lecture, which I'm just now getting around to explaining, or trying to explain. The title of my first lecture is The Masters of Suspicion. It's a wonderful book called The Philosophy of Paul Ricoeur. It collects a whole series of articles by the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur. And I'm not interested in all the articles. He has one in here about uh, uh, the critique of religion. And in it, he mentions the three great masters of suspicion of the 19th century. And it's not merely their intellectual work that began to make us feel estranged and alienated and separated from the holy world of previous times, the world in which we could find our meaning in God or through his works. They reflect a, 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 a sea change in the species view of itself. I would, I would have included the name of Darwin, the first, you know, to give a natural explanation of how we got here. To give, in the case of Marx and Nietzsche and Freud, the reason they're mentioned by Ricoeur is they raise a criticism that I personally don't see how any argument could get around. In a way, it's a counterpart to the believer's faith. Just like the believer's faith, even today in the late 20th century, if you want to hang on to it stubbornly enough, can't be shaken, although that's cold comfort given that any belief you want to hang on to stubbornly can't be shaken. Sort of the nature of human beings to be stubborn, obdurate to reason, and so on. Uh, 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 the, 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 the suspicion they raise is, is much deeper, and, and I think Ricoeur puts them together well, because when you're faced, and you, and you will be, in, if you, at least in some uh, exciting intellectual context with these critiques of religion, at first you will notice only the negative part. In other words, the destructive part of the criticisms. And I'll run through them quickly. I mean, and they can be run through quickly because these names, Nietzsche, Marx, and Freud, even Bill Bennett agrees they're all classics. Okay, so we're not... You know, we're not in here to like convert anyone to any other new religion or anything. These are classics. They are, in fact, markers in our culture of this sea change I'm talking about. They put before us the problem of false consciousness, of the self being false to itself. That problem is one that religion was ill-equipped to, to deal with. Ill-equipped to deal with. As long as we could believe with Descartes that if we knew something clearly and distinctly, we knew it, we were okay. 